Welcome to Mindfulness Manufacturing, the podcast for and with manufacturing leaders. It can be a challenging industry struggling with accountability, turnover, and engagement. Join us now on this journey as we gain new insights, moments of clarity, and self-awareness. Let's step outside of our comfort zones and uncover new perspectives to make your next day better. Grab your coffee and let's go. Good day, Mindfulness Manufacturing. Excited today, another international guest. We got Connor Swenson from the UK. And I was on a webinar a month or two ago where Connor was hosting. And about halfway through, I was like, I got to get this guy on our podcast. Our listeners need to hear from him. So why? Well, he uh, worked with Google for seven years uh, with engineers, which we know are similar to the to the manufacturing crowd, in what he does, he's helping others uh, develop focus and effectiveness, and ultimately sustain high performance. And what I love about it, it's the science of productivity. And when you're manufacturing, that is our hot topic. We want to make parts, right? We want productivity. Well, he does this with startups, and he uses modern mindfulness programs and teachings. Really, his mission is to help businesses rethink the definition of productivity uh, to create a happier, healthier organization. Uh, like for myself, with Operations Kickstart, my company, one of the big things that we focus on helping people is with retaining and attracting staff. So we know that this is important. And we all seem to have this dysfunctional relationship with time and how busy we are. And uh, yeah, so Connor is in the UK now. He uh, grew up in Minnesota, so we spent our younger years, uh, I did anyways, in the winter, Christmases, and summers, enjoying Minnesota as a Canadian, going there to visit my family, so we both know what extreme cold is. So welcome, Connor. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Such a, a kind, kind introduction. I'm glad we're not in, uh, in the Arctic tundra as we speak now. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, thanks for coming on today. And I'm going to jump right into it. So the first thing that I thought of after researching some of your studies was multitasking. And I find that there's always still this debate uh, of, of the, how valuable it is to multitask. I walk by people and they have their desk phone in one ear, their cell phone in the other ear, and somehow they're navigating their computer at the same time. And in our environment, a lot of times that gets rewarded, just that whole multitasking. I can do two things at once. We can have five things on the go. You've been studying the science. So what do you see here, Connor? Yeah, <laughs> multitasking, it's certainly the norm in, in modern workplaces. And I think technology absolutely has a huge role to play in making us feel like we can do all these things together. And look, you know, humans are amazing, uh, you know, amazing animals. We can certainly take a walk and have a phone call and make sure we cross the road. And, and if we, can, we can manage some degree of multitasking. However, when we think about combining two cognitive tasks, we're just not great at doing that. And so if you're writing an email and then your phone buzzes, you're not actually able to look at the phone and write the email at the same time. What you're actually doing is called switch tasking. And what the studies show is that by consistently going from one task and not completing it and switching our focus to another task and back and forth, it slows us down. And Gloria Mark, who's a research scientist at the University of California, Irvine, she's done quite a few different studies on multitasking. One of the most shocking statistics is that when you're, when you're in a, a deeply focused state of work and you get interrupted and you switch your focus and you begin multitasking, it can take 23 minutes to actually get back to the same level of sort of concentrated focus as you had before the interruption. And you just look at the statistics, you know, it's the average office employees checking their email every five minutes. Um, you know, we touch our phones, touching our phones on average 1,200 times a day we probably open them 80 to 150. So it's definitely an epidemic. And I think we, we like to think that we're doing more by multitasking, but in, in, in effect, we're, 
we're, we're really uh, putting obstacles into our, into our way of staying focused and getting quality work done. Yeah, one of the great practices in a lot of manufacturing plants called the open door policy, you know, which is basically you can come and talk to anybody at any time. And so what do you, what do you say to those people that are trying to focus, but at the same time, then they get torn because I don't want to seem rude. I want to be the leader that everybody can come to when they need me, but I can't get anything done. Yeah. First, I'll I'll caveat everything, but I say, by saying productivity is very personal. And so I don't think there's a one size fits all piece of advice or a method that's gonna that's gonna work for everybody. And you know, my experience being at Google, an extremely collaborative workplace. You know, that's how the organization was built. Everything's open floor office plans. There's no open door because no one's got a door on their office. And that that builds personal connection, right? The ability to kind of stop by someone's desk and have mm-hmm. a quick chat. Those informal weak ties are so important. However, however, when we when we don't create that space in the day to do our focused work, it's often that it doesn't really get done. So what I encourage, you know, companies that I work with is to find the balance that works for you. So the good news is that most people, when you look at their normal calendar, they have about zero minutes that set aside for deeply focused work when they're not being interrupted. And so if you go from zero (laughs) <laughs> from zero to 30 or 45 minutes, or ideally maybe one hour a day, there's a lot to be gained with small improvements. And there's simple things you can do. So at, at Google, you know, one of the things that, that was often done is you just put headphones on and it's just a subtle signal to let the team know, hey, you know, when I've got my headphones up, even if I'm not listening to something, I'm just kind of in the zone. I, you can close the door. Uh, and then you can schedule the time if you're a manager, right? If you want to have that open door policy, let people know when you're holding office hours and do it at a time that's better for you. So say, you know, in the afternoons, two to four, come by my office. That's when you're probably the lower energy. Those types of conversations are going to be better spent then. And then, you know, carve out that morning time or whenever is best for you to stay really focused. And it's finding this balance and, and, and using different things and having a conversation because you don't want to just shut your door starting tomorrow and then everyone thinks, wow, Trevor's never available. What happened? Mm-hmm. You want to have the conversation and say, hey, I want to get a bit more focused work done. And every time I've had those conversations and I've coached teams around that, everyone in the room is like, hey, I'd love a little bit more time, quiet time to focus on my stuff. Very, very, very rarely is anyone saying, oh, you know, there's too much uh, too much quiet time. I think I'd like to have us talking more. So yeah. it's a conversation, it's balanced, and it's finding what works in your environment and recognizing that it's, uh, there's no one size fits all approach, but having that conversation is a, a crucial first step. Yeah. And for so many people, they feel that they're in that victim mode of, I can't control it when people in general are kind not usually mm-hmm. like wake up being unkind. We do unkind things and we may be aggressive with each other. But w- when you usually ask for help and say, you know what? I was working with a, with an owner and he was having a hard time getting his quotes done. And that's kind of what we did. We talked to the whole company and said, hey, between 10 and 1130 every day, Ken is going to work on quotes with his door closed. And all of a sudden he started getting caught up. And the the main difference was, was just, expectations and communication yeah yeah then how did then how did ken show up outside of that hour during the day right it was ken a little bit more relaxed a little bit more friendly to the coworkers, a little bit more open minded to new opportunities because when 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 you get the stuff done that's most important to you you know that's why i think we have to rethink productivity it's not about just doing everything and going is, is, is getting as much done but if you take care of your most important work and you are consistent, it makes you a better teammate, a better leader, a better human. And when you, when on the back of your mind, it's nagging you that you haven't done your quote and it's Friday and you're five days of quotes behind, you're not going to be in a really good mood. You're not going to be open and collaborative to other people. So, you know, being proactive and carving out, I love that, you know, an hour a day. And I've seen teams that do that together. You know, they say, listen, we're going to find 
45 minutes, an hour a day when we're all not going to be on Slack and we're just only going to ping or call each other if there's an absolute emergency. Nice. And people, people that go from having Slack or, you know, WhatsApp or any of the chats that are going on in the office, if you go from having it open eight hours a day and then all of a sudden you get this hour a day where it's off, I mean, it becomes bliss. It's like people yes. can, they sit down and like, wow, I can really actually, <laughs> and, and not check my email, not check my Slack and just do what I need to do for an hour and then come back and open up to the, you know, the ongoing modern communication hustle. And if there's anything for the listeners to take away, it's a fact of, because I didn't even click until until you just said, Connor, is that we we were focused on that hour and a half but it's the time outside of that where you actually become more productive because you mm-hmm. got the meaningful work done and now I'm in a better mood. And when people are in a better mood, they feel safer and not as defensive and more creative and you get that discretionary effort. So yeah, it's, it's a compound effect. And a lot of times like, you know, the one comment I get from a lot is like, Trevor, I'm in meetings all day. Like I, I just don't have time. Like, how do you work with companies? Have you walked into companies, Connor? And, and it's like, whether it's manufacturing or whatever, it's just, Hey, it's just meetings. It's meetings back to back. I don't even have time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. At Google's this Google, I've worked on a lot of teams that have the same, you know, same, same issue. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. You know, one of the programs that I teach and that, that we first came connected um, through it is, is make time. And, and that the make time program is, is really about how to, you know, make time for the work that matters most to you. And one of the biggest underlying factors that we believe at make time is a cause for so much of our stress is defaults. And these defaults are just all around us. And the default at the office is every meeting that you are attend, you're invited to, you attend. You know, the default is that meetings are 30 to 60 minutes, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. one or the other. Questioning these defaults is sort of one of the first steps. Well, I'd say recognizing the defaults is the first steps, and then you can begin to question them. So I think every company is going to have, like I said, it's hard for me to give general generic advice, but some of the rules of thumb that I learned from Google is generally if when a meeting goes over seven attendees, you start to notice a drop in productivity. Our, our former CEO, the founder, Larry Page, says that for every person over seven, you, the meeting is 10% less effective. I, that's not a scientific rule. That's a rule <laughs> of thumb. Number two is, is meetings should generally be about decision making. Uh, lots of organizations have status update meetings, meetings to just tell people what's going on. Generally, it's best to keep that type of communication asynchronous. So synchronous communication means all of us in one place at the same time, listening to the same stuff. It's okay sometimes, but defaulting to asynchronous, meaning why don't we all eliminate a 60 minute status update meeting? And then we each take 10 or 15 minutes and we write out a few bullet points of what we're doing. And then, that circulated and we can review it as a team on our own time. And asynchronous is what makes remote collaboration work very, very well. And I think many companies are struggling, but when they transition in these last four months during you know, COVID-19, trying to figure out how can we move to more asynchronous. And the other thing with meetings, and you're not gonna just go on about other ways to operate, but <laughs> is, to all, is you always gotta have an owner and a decision maker. And yeah. at Google, Google, the rule of thumb was if, if a meeting doesn't have an agenda shared 24 hours before the meeting, then that meeting doesn't, shouldn't happen, doesn't need to happen, you don't need to go. And every meeting needs to have one person who's effectively responsible for driving that meeting and figuring out what are the decisions that are made. Because too often, these meetings just pile up and like everyone shows up and it's just around the round robin, around the horn and mm-hmm. waste so much, t- you know, so much time and people just they don't even need to tell you what they're doing, but they just say like, they're like, oh, I'll just raise my hand and give an update. So I think <laughs> generally, generally speaking, I think if teams can start to question, do we really need this meeting? Can we pare it down in size? Does every meeting have a decision owner? Um, 
and be focused when you have a meeting. So take a, like bringing it back to mindfulness. Yeah. Take a, take a minute when a meeting starts and let people settle into the room, allow them to kind of bring their head where their body is, take a few, you know, deep breaths, and then ask people to turn off their phones. And if they don't need their laptop, you know, turn it off. Absolutely. Resetting those defaults so that people aren't all sitting in a meeting, reading emails, checking their phone will make meetings so much more productive. Yeah. I don't have the data on it either, but I know from myself getting coached or, you know, working with manufacturing owners or leaders, it's shop floor time, right? The, the money yeah. is made on the shop floor. They don't, manufacturing plants don't make any money in the office. Maybe by doing yeah. some quotes, maybe by doing some engineering improvements, but really the money is made on the shop floor. So if we can get out of the meetings and get out on the floor, and then when we're in the meetings, then we're present. I like that number of seven. That's interesting because uh, you, you do find as, as a facilitator, how do you keep everybody engaged? Because if they're not all engaged, they probably don't need to be there and they'd be so happy not to be there. Yeah. <laughs> or just feel like, hey, I should raise my hand and just say something. We should. And then I've been in meetings where they'll be like, is there anything else? And I'm like, oh no, don't ask that question. <laughs> don't ask we that can question. Leave now. <laughs> yeah. That's not a good facilitator question, at least not uh, yeah. if, you've, if you've solved your objective, if you had an objective. So that's good advice too, Connor, just, just coming out with that, you know, with, uh, with that clear objective. So, you know, we're on this journey of mindfulness and manufacturing. And there is a lot of skept skepticism on this whole combination. Now, you've worked with a lot of engineers, a lot of people that think like a tool and die maker, like a machinist. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of engineers, and it's just a different level of, of thinking. And it's very process oriented. So how, how you talk a little bit about the science, like how have you and how has Google and everyone made that transition because that's that's really part of our mission is to help make that transition because we know that you know i'm more relaxed and focused so when i say relaxed it doesn't mean i mean you can clear that up too right it doesn't mean that people are, at google are on couches and they're relaxed it's it's not like that and it's it's a very high level um, educated skilled staff so how, how do you how do you get past that how do you convince them yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. I, I can't say we've, we convinced everybody. Uh, of the, of the <laughs> I would say at least get, get the conversation going. <laughs> get the conversation going. So, so w one of the other main programs that I, that I teach and, um, and offer to businesses is called Search Inside Yourself. And Search Inside Yourself began back in 2007, and it was started by a Google engineer. So that program from day one had its mission of how can we bring a case for mindfulness and, and, and show the benefits to people that are skeptical and very rational and they want to see the data. And one of the most interesting, I think, breakthroughs that Search Inside Yourself has offered into the world of mindfulness is by connecting mindfulness to the broader skill sets of emotional intelligence. Now, we all intuitively know that emotional intelligence is important in life and in business. So, you know, when I do a workshop, if I do a straw poll, I say, hey, think, you know, if you're listening, think about the three or four qualities that come to mind when you think about a great leader in your organization mm -hmm. or a great leader in your life. And people are gonna start to say, okay, you know, they're, you know, inspiring. You know, they're, you know, maybe good listeners or empathetic, they're charismatic, yeah. good communicators. These are really broadly speaking, all emotional intelligence skills. Now Google is filled with high IQ. <laughs> I don't know how I, I, I don't know how I got in, but I can tell you the people that I, the people that I worked with were very high IQ and, and <clears throat> emotional intelligence, it, it sets sets good leaders uh, apart, or sets great leaders apart from good leaders, I would say. So what Search Insider Self did, bringing it back here, is it, it showed that 
you can actually begin to train your emotional intelligence through mindfulness. And the way that this is basically built up is that the core foundational skill of emotional intelligence is knowing yourself. And that's generally called self-awareness. And so Search Inside Yourself takes what Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book titled Emotional Intelligence, he really popularized this idea in the 90s. Mm -hmm. It takes his sort of his framework and which starts with sort of self-awareness into self-management uh, and onwards up into leadership skills. And it said, look, we can train our self-awareness because our brain has neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is a fun and funky sounding word, but it's quite simple. It just means that what you think, what you do, and you pay attention to, it changes the structure and the function of your brain. What you think, do, and just pay attention to changes the structure and function of your brain. Let me give you a real life example. So I'm, I'm here in London and there are a lot of research in neuroplasticity. One of the popular ones is they looked at London taxi cab drivers. And when you drive a London taxi cab, the city is a maze. And what they found is that over the lifetime of a taxi cab driver, that their hippocampus actually grew in size and strength. That's the area of your brain related to your spatial memory. This is a huge breakthrough for neuroplasticity because we thought for a long time that by the time you're maybe 30, your brain sort of stopped growing and evolving and that you kind of had a fixed brain, that you're very plastic when you're young, but it stopped. But these breakthroughs in the last three decades have shown us our brain is very plastic. So that's, this, that's one of the big parts, neuroplasticity. Two, mindfulness allows you to train the regions of your brain that are important for more self-awareness and self-management. So one of the big challenges that we all have is we have an emotional brain, the limbic system, it's an ancient part of our brain. And then we have the more rational brain, the prefrontal cortex. And when we get triggered, when something happens that upsets us, something breaks on the manufacturing line and we go, oh shit, <laughs> the emotional part of our brain oh, yeah. overreacts. Absolutely. And our rational part goes offline. And what mindfulness practice has been shown to do is it basically creates more bandwidth between your emotional and your rational brain, which allows you to basically have a greater management of your own emotions. And so, I could go on and on. This is a two day long program, but <laughs> what we started, what, what we started to show and what search inside yourself does is look, any, everyone that wants to succeed in an organization is thinking, yeah, I could probably use more emotional intelligence if I want to be a senior leader, a manager, et cetera. And we said, look, you can train your brain just the same way you can train your body at the gym. And now we, we, we've known this for, you know, meditators have known this for many, many thousands of years, but we've only recently discovered this with, the really the new field of neuroscience. And by training the brain, we can actually increase the strength and the capacity of regions of our brain that allow us to have more management of our emotions. And we start to kind of piece together that science and show that, look, this is a skill that can be learned and it can be done in a relatively short amount of time. Then you've got the attention of engineers that are thinking, oh wait, I can actually reprogram my brain. Mm -hmm. I can change. You know, and we like to say and to engineers at Google is the software can change the hardware. So actually what, what you think, the oh thoughts God. you think, whether you think more positive thoughts, you think more negative thoughts, it actually changes the structure of your brain. And then you start to get people's attention and go, wow, I can, I can actually re, reprogram my brain through mindfulness and meditation. Then we have our, their attention and then we're kind of, we're off on this journey of, of the practices and the way to integrate it into work. So that's, uh, you know, you got to build a solid case to convince, to convince engineers. So that's, that's a lot of, a lot of words to, to digest there, but you know, that's how we get the conversation started. <laughs> no, that's great, Connor. I mean, it, it, we have to go to those levels of conversations because there's a percentage out there. You, you can say that, Hey, a happier workforce is going to be more productive and then sometimes you get that mentality of, well, everyone's getting paid to do this. It's their job. We just need mm -hmm. to show up and deliver. And those leaders are just missing out on all that discretionary effort and just can't see it. But, you know, I appreciate that whole 
science of productivity, right? And the fact of, you know, these aren't just certain belief windows and opinions. This is actually based on research. And mm -hmm. when you've worked in an environment where you have that and you're killing it, getting the results, it's like, man, you don't have the turnover issues. You know, when you have those meetings and people know who's responsible for what and when, and then you can follow up and there's a little bit of accountability now, which actually relieves tension. People think accountability creates tension. Well, when the expectations are clear and presented up front, it, it actually relieves tension because everybody knows what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, people can be creative. They can take a couple of risks and make good decisions. I've talked to people before and they're frustrated because the supervisor in the off shift is making bad decisions. And I said, well, how are you helping them? He said, well, I call them every couple of hours asking them, what's the update? What's he doing? I said, do you think that's helping? And they're like, no. Well, then why do we keep on repeating that? <laughs> I yeah. Don't know. I don't know. And the other one is uh, we talk about, uh, I talk to some leaders and it's like, well, this person just, you know, they just need to make it happen. That's a, that's a great terminology. Let's just go out there and get her done. Let's make it happen. And it just takes willpower, right? You just got to will it to happen. What, what's your thoughts uh -huh. around that, Connor? Yeah, so I think willpower is a is an interesting and almost a pernicious or a slightly dangerous idea because it doesn't seem from the latest science that it is as important or as real as we think. So what most of the the research today around when it comes to especially habit setting and better uh, you know, having more positive behaviors is that your environment and sort of the atmospheres in which we operate are actually much more important than willpower. And the people that are highly productive and the people that you see around you that are, you know, they're getting it all done, but they're, they're calm and they're staying healthy and they've got a great, you know, social life going on. They've got all these things it's not really a result of uh, much more willpower. It's that they've made some smarter decisions to create an environment where willpower isn't uh, as necessary. So let me give you a practical example. If you wake up and you, let's say you go to the office or you just go down to your living room and you open up your computer mm -hmm. and, on, and on your desktop, it, you have your, you know, your, internet browser open, Chrome or Safari, and it's got it's logged into email, and you've got your LinkedIn and Twitter open in a couple tabs. Your default behavior is going to be to start checking email, looking at the news, etc., because your environment is set up in that way. And so it's going to be much more difficult to stay on task and focus, etc. Whereas if you make the decision and create a habit of closing out all of those sort of distracting windows at night, cleaning up your desktop so that when you open up your workplace in the morning, let's say you have a blank and empty screen with a beautiful backdrop, and then you actually have the intention to say, okay, what's the most important thing for me to do first? Mm -hmm. the, that person doesn't need as much willpower. So we have to think about what it, what's in it, what's in my environment that I can sort of tweak uh, you know, if, if you've got ice cream in the freezer, I guarantee you it's going to be hard to avoid eating it. But if you Absolutely. can make the conscious decision to say, <laughs> hey, when, I, when I, I'm going to go shopping in a, in a, when I'm not hungry, I'm going to make better decisions at the store, then you create the environment at home that's going to be, you're going to have healthier decisions. And we can do that at work. And so that's really one, one way to think about sort of willpower and how we set ourselves up for success. And it does, it does take a bit of work and, and experimentation and you have to figure out how to, uh, how to kind of reconfigure the way, you know, figure out what's, what's causing you to fall off track, what's causing you to be distracted and then go back and remove some of those, those triggers in the environment. Um, it does take work, but it's, it's really the only way to, to sustain that positive behavior change over time. You know, being from Canada, I got one of the first blackberries made when they came out. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, I got these blackberries and now I could check email at phone 
at home. And then we had a great IT department and they created this app which showed all our production numbers in real time, 24 hours a day. So I could check our production lines every minute of the day. If I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, I would check it. And then if I thought something was up, then I would call and check on my supervisors. Or sometimes my boss might send me a text and say, what's going on with line three? And I'd be like, oh my gosh, I haven't checked my phone enough. And it just, and then it, it just drove the wrong behavior because now the supervisors kind of know, well, they're going to call anyways, and I'm going to focus fixing this. And then I wasn't present at home with my kids, right? Because now I'm kind of, I'm not in that space. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to dance at two different weddings here and uh, at the same time, and it's just not working, uh, but I did it for years and uh, I, I wouldn't do it that way again. But yeah, it's, it's having that, like you said, that discipline. One of the things that you, that you helped me with, Connor, was just notifications on my uh, on all my devices. I, I changed after watching your webinar and talk about the the infinity pool. I like that. Yeah, infinity pool is a term from from Make Time uh, that that Jake and John, the authors, came up with. And it, basically, if you think about any app that you can kind of you know pull down or swipe to refresh and has endless amounts of content that's an infinity pool, <laughs> you know? So we're thinking about things like you know, ESPN or Twitter or Instagram or the stock market even. And infinity pools are so dangerous when it comes to distraction because they're just never ending, right? They just go and go and go. And one of the big um, insights from make time, it goes back to this idea of, of defaults and when you think about those apps, you know, whether it's Twitter or, or ESPN, whatever it's going to be, you know, what's your, your flavor of distraction? Mm -hmm. they're, des they're designed to be frictionless and easy to use. So you can, you know, you open up your phone, you can do two clicks in the app store, you've got a brand new app on your phone, and then it takes so little effort to open it and to swipe and to refresh. And Jake and John were, were product designers at Google and worked on Gmail and YouTube and what they saw was, you know, I don't think technology is necessarily this nefarious evil out there, you know, to get you sort of uh, machine, but simply put that, you know, the incentives of, of Twitter are to keep you using Twitter. And so they make it fun and entertaining and they've got a great algorithm so that every time you open it, you've got new stuff to, you know, excite you and give mm -hmm. you dopamine hits. And if you, if you, leave it unchecked and you let the default be, I'm going to have this app on my phone. It's so easy to get locked into to the infinity pool using it again and again and again. So what we encourage people to do is to reset the default. So try deleting the app and checking that thing on the web. Odds are you'll check it a little bit less. You'll find that I do certainly with, you know, take Twitter as an example, mm -hmm. much less engage, much less engaging on the web. I'm not also, on, I don't have my laptop with me everywhere I go. So when I'm waiting in line, you know, for a coffee, it's not available and ready to me. So I don't have to have the willpower to not check my email or to check Twitter or check Slack on my phone because I've created a default where those, those apps don't exist for me. So thinking about that, I didn't think about what is, you know, what's, 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 we call your distraction kryptonite. What's that, <laughs> what's that thing on your, what's that thing on your phone that is taking up all your time and you constantly find yourself opening and yeah. you open a different app and then you find yourself there and experiment, you know, see if you can live without it on your phone or see if you can delete it on the weekends. If it's your email and, and, and have a couple of days without it and, and experiment to see what it's like to get your sort of time and attention back. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of time and attention that I think we don't recognize uh, how much we lose, but you know, the average American spends, uh, about four hours per day on their smartphone and they watch on average about four hours a day of TV. And Jeez, that's a 30 year day, not coming that's to wild. sleep. And <laughs> yeah. And no, the thing is like no one wakes up in the morning and it sets their intention. I'm going to spend four hours today looking at my phone. You know, <laughs> those, those things happen not by, not by conscious choice, but because they're the default. So um, changing those defaults. And if you spend four hours today, Imagine spending just three, you get a whole hour back in your day to do things that might benefit you in a bigger way. 
Um, and carving away at that, I think, is a, a slow and gradual, continual process. But you know, it's compound effects. If you can just reduce it a little bit and a little bit day by day, then you can really see exponential effects over time. Yeah, my, I, I love when I go up to someone and just say, hey, how you doing? And I usually get good and busy. People busy. love to say that we're busy. And it's, it, it comes back to what you said, the whole self-awareness. I was getting ready for the podcast this morning. And my self-awareness is, is way better. My self-management has a long way to go. And mm -hmm. I was, I just caught myself and I reached over to my computer and I was just writing with pen on paper and I checked my email and I'm like, wow, I just checked my email. <laughs> that was just for a dopamine hit. That's all that was for. And I didn't have anything that I, I had no emergencies in the outlay and I just lost my focus. So it's one of those things, like you said, it's going to the gym. I've been doing this for many years now and I feel like I'm still a, a rookie and uh, that's why it's kind of fun to talk about on the show and, 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 you know, just share this with everybody else. And, and, you know, we can take, we can take control. And the first thing is just, you know, seeing it, labeling it. Yeah. And, you know, that's a start. Connie, you, you've left us with some great stuff today. Uh, if there's one thing you want to leave the listeners with today, what would that be? You know, when we, we were having a chat about this and thinking about what's, what's the biggest benefit that I've seen from, from mindfulness in business at, at Google and at startups is, is, is creating this sort of space to pause. And, you know, so much of our lives, we're kind of going through at warp speed and we're, you know, we're distracted, we're behind on our to-do lists. And when, when upsetting things happen, we react. You know, we, we get angry, irritated, frustrated. We might lash out, you know, at our partner, at our coworkers. And probably the single greatest freedom that mindfulness has given me and, and I know many others in, in the practice is, is this ability to just stop when you find yourself getting triggered uh, and give yourself the freedom to choose how to respond. And one of the practices that has kept with me for, for a long, long time and, and it's still useful to me on a daily basis is just called stop. You just envision a big bright red stop sign. Whenever you find yourself feeling irritated, frustrated, overwhelmed, and there's four steps. First, you stop. That's the pause. It's the most important part. You stop what you're doing. T is you take a breath, maybe three breaths if you can. <laughs> Taking breaths actually reinforces the pause, but it also calms down your central nervous system and it brings that more rational, logical part of your brain back online. So your the hijacking of your amygdala is slowed down. Mm -hmm. O is you observe, and you just observe what it is you're feeling. Can you label it? Can you think, oh, I'm feeling really frustrated. I'm feeling ticked off. And just by doing those three things, by stopping, taking a breath, observing how you feel, you step out of that frustration for a moment, and then you can do the final step, which is P, you can proceed. And, you know, Viktor Frankl, you know, and it's a Holocaust survival or survivor, and he wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, and his, his, his teachings are often shared in the world of mindfulness. And he said, you know, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose. And in that you know, power to choose lies our freedom. And I think what he's saying is we can't control all the stuff that's going to happen to us day to day, but we can control our response. And mm -hmm. a simple practice like that, that stop practice, it can really change the way that we show up at work. We handle our difficult emotions. Um, and it's definitely a practice. It, 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 it develops over years and years. And slowly you, you become more free uh, less reactive and you're able to respond with a bit more dignity, a bit more grace, a bit more mindfulness. So uh, yeah, that's my, I'll, I'll leave people with that as a practice and an idea. And, and maybe if you're listening to this on your commute into work or on your commute home, you know, you can just take a, a moment before you walk into work or before you walk into your home and take a moment to you know, recognize how you're feeling and then enter a new space and uh, bring awareness into the moment. So the next time that press goes down or the robot won't come back into its original program, 
Yeah, it's amazing, especially if you're the, the senior person in the room or on the line, just by you doing what Connor's kind of saying is that people will recognize that. And then everybody else acts a little bit calmer. And then all of a sudden, we make better decisions. And we become more productive, which is kind of where we started this whole podcast with. Connor, I got two important questions I always have to ask. What was your first concert you attended? Oh, I was so lucky. Thanks to my mom. She brought me to see Eric Clapton Ooh. at the Excel Center in Minneapolis. I mean, that's hard to beat. Uh, and he was opened up by Robert Randolph and the family band who plays like a, a sliding lap guitar. And they came out into an encore of Layla. I was about 12 or 13 with long shaggy hair and a bandana. I was, I was rocking out. So that was a very <laughs> fond memory. It. And now you're in the UK. That's awesome. <laughs> and if you were stuck on an island and you can only bring a collection of one artist, you can bring everything they've written, everything they've sent, sung or produced or bands they've been in or solo. You just bring one artist quickly off the top of your head. What, what's that artist you're going to take with you? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, this is tough. Because you need you need to be in good spirits if you're on an island. I'm probably bringing James Brown. I'm probably nice. bringing some like some some soul and some upbeat funk to to keep myself dancing and happy on this island for for a long time. I I think musically that I think I'd have to go for for music over over the written word. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll say James Brown and leave it there. I feel good. Love it. Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to thank you, Connor, like for listeners, like I didn't know Connor a couple months ago and you're just your generosity and your just pure intent of, of making us a more productive, a happier place. And, and we knowing that to go hand in hand and your mission, uh, just very blessed to have you on the show and, and met you and, and I, I would, I will put your contact information in the show notes, uh, best way to get a hold of you or to follow you? Yeah, I, I'm on LinkedIn and, and Twitter the most. And I send a, a weekly newsletter called 1% Wisdom uh, on Thursdays, where I share sort of a, one idea each week to, uh, to, to help you on that continuous path of, of self improvement and development. So, yeah, I'd All love right. to love to hear from any of the listeners. So, reach out directly and thank you thank you so much for the time and and for for everything you're doing to share share this wonderful message with your community so it's a an honor to to spend this time with you right on likewise thanks connor cool see you hey folks thanks for taking the time and joining us today if you enjoyed this episode share it with someone and make their next day better if you haven't subscribed do so now, rate and review. It means so much, and we will share your comments on the next episode in a couple weeks. If you want to drive results, the first step is realizing how you show up.